Kinsey is so polarizing on uh, the the online forums, even to this day. It's interesting. He'll come up and some. I'll bring up Kinsey or someone will bring up Kinsey. It's like, oh, I hate him. I hate that character so much. You know, he just just makes my blood boil. I wish he would just die. I I, I can't stand him. Like, and I I have to ask, and I often will ask. It's like, isn't that because the writer and the actor are doing their job, or do you hate the character because he's not written well? It's never that. It's because he's he he is a proper realized opposition to your hero to to yeah, the people that you're an antagonist for. and you you wouldn't love your hero i don't i mean maybe there are people or fan you know fans out there who would just like you know everybody to be shiny and happy and holding hands and skipping through the stargate every week but <laughs> but you you need antagonists your hero is only ever as good as your bad guy is bad and and uh you know i think Inevitably, the more you love your hero, the more you're going to hate the person standing in their way. So, so it's a testament once again to being successful at creating that dramatic opposition. Mm -hmm. so I don't take that as a negative at all. In fact, I think you know Ronnie Cox would agree that he was. He, it means the more people hate me, the more I'm doing my job well. You know? Yeah, but and they hate they they hate him more than they hate world dominating oppressive gold you know and i and I, was, I was fascinated by that it's like okay you I hate you hate the politician more than you hate this guy who's closer, wiped out because, millions of people but he's closer to reality like yeah they're, they're transferring some that's correct they're projecting know, some hate that they have for something that is real <laughs> politicians uh, onto him <laughs> and and uh and whereas you know the and and, and you know and the alien on some level, you know that your heroes are going to defeat the alien. Right. And and the problem is, too often, politicians win. Yeah, that's true, too. And I think, you know, I think we feel this frustration uh, around that type of, like, it's hard to fight bureaucracy. And it's, again, one of the reasons I liked those elements of of the show was because it kind of, you know, people often ask, well, what are the, what are the reasons? Like, why did Stargate work? What are the, you know, sort of tentpole reasons why Stargate was successful? And I think um, one, you know, the one we talk about a lot is the sense of humor, which mm -hmm. a lot of sci-fi shows don't have. And, and two was that it was taking place now. It was us. And, and, we were not afraid to bring like other shows dealt with those things through similarity and allegory and, 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 you know, that type of, of bringing the world into their world. But it, you know, in Stargate, it was our world. So we could have those discussions and those characters like politicians and uh, presidents and real life generals come into the mm -hmm. show and, and, uh, and play themselves. You know, we talked about this in a previous conversation about Mayborn and his evolution throughout the series. Um, but McKay obviously was probably, I would say, the pinnacle example. Oh man, Ab absolutely, he's he's absolutely up there. You know, if you can if you can think of someone that you'd that you'd want to return, I re I remember the announcement for for Atlantis and being like wow on one hand and on the other hand is this going to work and we'll we'll obviously get into that discussion when we come to Atlantis um but uh yeah he just, he just flew mean, off the I page don't know if we ever, I don't know if we ever talked about this or if anyone else ever mentioned it but he, you know he wasn't originally the guy in yeah the, Benjamin but, Ingram uh we had had gone through a long casting process and um and as i said i've said before that you know casting a show particularly like this where there's four or five leads it's about finding the right chemistry mm -hmm. um and so you, you know and you never know what you're going to get like you can have an idea and try and force it and say this is the character we've created for this show um but sometimes you just don't find 
the actor that suits that role. And so at that, you know, at that point in the process, we kind of looked at each other and we're like, we kind of have the guy, we just have to change, <laughs> change the character a little bit. So, um, yeah, we, we, we always did. There's something I, I, I learned and got to give a lot of credit to, to Jonathan and Brad for is, 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 you know, uh, take the best actor that comes in for an audition, regardless of whether they're perfect for the role you created and, you know, change, change the script to suit the actor. Cause that's more valuable than mm -hmm. you, know, you trying to essentially, you know, execute your vision with inferior tools. If you've uh, got something popping right in front of you, I mean, suppose you'd be crazy not to try and make it work. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. And, and yeah. I don't David, know. If... Uh, Go ahead. No, I just, Dave, David's a, uh, 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 you know, incredible force force to be reckoned with and i think that you know this I, it would have been it would have been awkward for him to make the transition to atlantis had he only appeared in 48 hours i think redemption really facilitates the the likability of his character especially once sam accepts him that's the key because once sam accepts him then we are um given permission as an audience to accept him as well because sam's on our side we're with right. Sam. So. Right, because he's he's a class of character that is what I like to call unlikable likable. Right. <laughs> he's 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 unlikable. You don't right. you don't like him initially, and it's only after you kind of get to know him. He's a villain by by his in his in his experience. Yeah. And then the more you get to know him, the more you kind of appreciate him. Uh, and then you kind of get to like him. Um so it takes a little while. He's more mm -hmm. of an acquired taste. But also, I enjoyed disliking him at the same time. Right. Well, yes. You know, yes. when he and would I, mistreat always, uh, uh, underlings, you know? I I've mean... always said that about, <laughs> you know, with with other writers in discussion about pitches and creating shows that, um, you know, you often use the, the word likable uh, at... Uh, in terms of evaluating your lead character. But the truth is a better word is watchable. Yeah. Like you don't have to create like the old school way of writing television was that your lead character had to be the hero and mm -hmm. had to be likable. And a lot of actors would look at their part and give notes related to, well, this makes me unlikable. And it's like, right. mm, maybe that's just making you more three-dimensional and more relatable because you're not perfect. Um, but I think there's, you know, and then, and then we sort of fell into that long, long, dark hole of, uh, you know, anti-hero heroes of, of people horribly flawed, but at the same time, compellingly watchable. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the reason is, more than likability, we are attracted to competence. And that competence can happen in one particular arena, uh, while the rest of the character is incredibly flawed. And mm -hmm. so we admire that competence in that one arena, and at the same time enjoy seeing them trip and fall and do bad things in other ways, because it's much more related, relatable to our own lives, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Breaking Bad. I mean, you look at that one. If Walter White is really good at doing something illegal, does it kind of make you feel bad that you're enjoying watching him do it? Or at least no, I would enjoy watching him get out of the situation that he put himself in. We all so. want to do we all want to do dangerous, bad things with safety guardrails on. Like, there's, <laughs> something, there's something kind of fun about living in that world. It's like why gangsters are so you know, appealing in the same mm -hmm. respect. You know, Tony Soprano was, you know, he was a murderous gangster, but he was also the best at it in the in the within the show. He was the smartest guy, and he also didn't want to be doing it. Like there was an aspect to him that was like he just wanted to be a good dad and he wanted mm -hmm. to get out 
but he was also really good at what he did. <laughs> he was much better at that than anything else he could find to do in life or that yeah. he could figure out to do in life. And so that created a push pull that I think everybody is, you know, is, is interested and attracted to is that sort of struggle. Um, and at the same time, you know, kind of like I, so there's occasionally people I wish I could strangle. <laughs> Thank you for watching this clip from Dial the Gate. If you enjoyed the video, please consider giving us a thumbs up with that like button. It will encourage the algorithm to show this to other Stargate fans. Also, please consider sending this to a fellow Stargate friend. I also want to invite you to subscribe to future episodes right here on YouTube. We are a live show, so changes are likely to happen all the time. And if you plan on joining us live, you'll want to be the first to know. Be sure to visit dialthegate.com for the complete guest schedule so you'll know when to join us and ask your very own questions to our guests. See you on the the other side.